Once again, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the first in a series of WILD webinars. Um, we'll, be, we'll be putting a series together over the year and looking at doing a webinar every quarter on different topics and inviting different people to participate. However, today we're, we're focusing on how a hybrid terrestrial and a satellite LoRaWAN network can transform the supply chain. So my name's Alistair Williamson, I'm the CEO of Wild Networks, and today we've invited another three of our partners to present, namely Luke Perrar from UTELSAT. Now, UTELSAT is one of the largest satellite providers in the world, and Luke will take us through a presentation after I've finished mine. We've also got Bruce Chatterley, who's the CEO of Senet, and uh, Senet are the largest LoRaWAN network operator in the US, and also offer LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN connectivity in about another 72 countries globally. And finally, we've got Rich Myers from Track Ashore, who's, who's stepped in to replace uh, Dom as a speaker. Unfortunately, Dom can't attend. And Track Ashore is a renowned global supplier of asset tracking sensor solutions. So together, we formed a consortium earlier this year to offer a solution to the market combining LoRaWAN terrestrial and LoRaWAN satellite IoT networks into the supply chain. And this will actually form the basis of our webinar. From an administration perspective, we, we've got, each got about sort of 12 minutes to talk. And that'll leave us about 10 minutes at the end of the session for questions and answers. And you can actually type these questions into the question dialogue uh, box um, on your screen. But if you could please, and the name of the company or the person that you're actually addressing the question to. So I can actually filter these through and make sure we get through um, all of the questions um, in an orderly manner. So I'm going to kick off the presentation, then I'll hand over to Luke, then it'll be handed over to Bruce and then to Rich, and then we get to the question and answer session. So before we go further into the, 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 the consortium uh, and what our plans are moving forward, Forward. I just wanted to introduce and update you all on WILD. So WILD's a, a, a Swedish company. Uh, we're listed on the NASDAQ First North in Stockholm. Uh, we have operational um, centre in UK in Cambridge. And what we do is we, we offer affordable, low power satellite connectivity for the Internet of Things anywhere in the world. As I'm sure you're aware, you know, 85% of the world's surface has got no access to the internet. And according to McKinsey's, th th this is holding back the deployment and growth of IoT networks from adding up to 3 trillion US dollars to global GDP in the next 10 years. So at, at Wild, we developed Wild Connect. Um, it's an affordable wireless solution to connect IoT devices and sensors directly to UTELSAT low earth orbiting satellite constellation that's named ELO. And hence, by combining um, this solution, we basically can offer all of our customers connectivity anywhere in the world, providing 100% global coverage. So wh where are we going with our solution uh, at WILD? So, you know, WILD's focus it is mainly on agriculture, the environment, energy, utilities, maritime, and the supply chain. And I've, I've listed a few of the use cases under each of those markets on, on the, the, the right-hand side of the slide. I don't intend to go through all of these use cases because you know uh, our, our focus is gonna be talking more on just one use case that the consortiums put together, which is focusing on the supply chain. But to give you an idea of the size of the market, there are there are multiple act applications and use cases, and you know reports are, are out there that forecast this market to grow to about 5.9 billion US dollars in 2025. So wh where where are we in in this in this journey? So with Wild, you know we're currently in the test phase. So we're we're testing our solution against the UTELSAT um, constellation, um, and we're testing it with a significant number of launch partners. And the plan is that once we've completed the testing, then we'll be looking to launch the full end-to-end -end service, the satellite service in the second half of 2022. So I talked about launch partners and the, the test phase that we're going through at the moment. And um, 
I, I just wanted to give you a view on who these launch partners are, and I've, I've put down some logos. There's some substantially large corporates that are all particularly interested in getting ahead of the game and actually working with us um, in the test phase. And we've signed these companies up as, as launch partners. Now, the, the, these companies who, in, in the main, have a need to solve their connectivity issues in hard to reach areas to to manage and collect data from their assets and sensors in the field. And they range from corporations in agriculture, in energy, utilities, sensor manufacturers, uh, maritime providers, a full range of the type of organization you'd expect to be interested in a satellite IoT solution, i.e. providing connectivity in that 85% of the world's surface where there's currently no access to the internet. I just want to address before we get to the consortium, just address, you know, what does wild offer to the market? So we, we launched our um, wild connect product range, our LRF HSS hybrid terrestrial and satellite IoT modules, terminals and evaluation products in March this year, really about three weeks ago, we, we launched the solution. Um, it's actually gone very well. Um, we received purchase orders for, for, for over 30 million krona to date uh, in the last two weeks, and we'll be ramping up that, um, that sales uh, as we go through the launch, uh, the test phase, and through to the launch phase. And in respect to the second offer that we put out to the market, that, that's Wild Data. And, and Wild Data is actually the service fee that our customers would pay us for operating that network. And obviously, we'll be launching um, the Wild Data uh, service plans in the second half of 22 when we've got sufficient satellite coverage for specific use cases. Now, as I mentioned, you know, one of the verticals we're addressing um, is the supply chain and the, the use cases tracking and monitoring of assets. And this is the use case that actually brought together the consortium of UTELSAT, Senate, Trackershaw and Wild to basically create a hybrid terrestrial and satellite LoRaWAN IoT network to provide 100% coverage, supporting asset tracking and monitoring. And as I said previously, we plan to take this use case um, as a consortium to the market in the second half of, of 22. The, the potential benefits we can provide are, are, are really quite staggering. And I'll just quote a few numbers to position the problem that we hope can go, we hope that we can go some way to try and solve, namely sort of reducing in transit damage, um, 2.4 billion dollars of goods are lost, damaged or perished every year in transit. And that's just while at sea. You know, the second thing we're looking at is eliminating delays. And it's an astonishing 81% of businesses globally experience a supply chain disruption every year, costing them billions in lost revenue. And reducing theft, um, the cost to companies exceeds more than $30 billion a year. And so our whole concept of creating this consortium of putting a hybrid terrestrial and satellite IoT solution to basically provide our customers with 100% global coverage is the real leverage that we're actually putting out to market as a consortium this year. As I talked about the consortium, we, we call it the Mimic Consortium. Um, we, we, we formed it with uh, Senate, UTELSAT, Trekashore, and obviously Wild, and we formed it earlier this year. And it's really about combining, combining all of our capabilities to deploy IoT into the supply chain to address some of the issues from my previous slide. And I think, as I said before, the key to the consortium is creating this hybrid terrestrial and satellite IoT network to create 100% global coverage for our customers. So supply chain, you know, will be the, 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 the first use case the consortium is going to focus on. However, as we move through uh, the next few months, we will start to look at addressing additional use cases and we, we'll keep everyone up to speed as to where we are with additional use cases we're looking at. Now, my last slide uh, really sort of outlines how the consortium collectively puts together the end-to-end -end solution for supply chain. I think the pictorial there is, is fairly self-explanatory, but 
UTELSAT basically is providing uh, the enabling low Earth orbiting constellation of satellites um, enabled to collect data using LoRaWAN as a technology. Senet uh, provides the terrestrial LoRaWAN network. Track Ashore provides the asset tracking and monitoring sensors and wild networks provide the connectivity from all of these sensors either to a terrestrial LoRa network if it's available, so if it's in coverage, or if not, it'll deliver the data directly to the satellites in those areas where there's no existing wireless coverage. So together, we, we're, we, we enable the supply chain to resolve some pretty large issues they face by providing this 100% global coverage for their IoT solutions. And I'd like to end my presentation here and hand over to the rest of the partners that can update you on their individual companies and also their plans for the consortium. So I'm going to pass over now to Luke. So let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's dive a bit deeper into the details that is indeed enabling the, the solutions for the supply chain and logistics uh, that we are uh, let's say putting together as a consortium. So the enabling part that UTELSAT is looking after is really this, uh, let's say, extending those LoRa one networks that have been existing for uh, for quite some time, and that Senate has been highly successful in in deploying. And how to extend these to the areas that are not covered and will never be covered of the planet. So first, uh, let's say a few. Uh, a few words on uh, who UTELSAT is, a uh, little bit of uh, history, I will go fast on that, but we've been around more than that 45 years uh, as, a, as a company, uh, publicly listed in uh, Paris, in the Paris Stock Exchange since 2005. Uh, our market cap is around uh, 2.6 billion euros, 3, 3 billion uh, uh, dollars. Uh, we are operating in uh, various areas of uh, satellite connectivity, whether it's about broadcasting content and videos and TVs, as a matter of fact, as well as delivering uh, broadband connectivity. Uh, last year, for instance, we invested in OneWeb, which is a lower orbit constellation that is designed for uh, broadband connectivity uh, in, the B2B, uh, in the B2B area. So uh, that's an area of a large investment for us. IoT is another one where we see a very uh, high potential and that's what we are doing with uh, with this uh, Eero service. That's uh, that I'm going to talk you uh, talk to you a bit more about right now. Let's say it, it, it all started on our side to say to let's say from uh, the realization that low power wide area networks and these uh, LPWA technologies are excellent in uh, connecting assets that sends very small message that don't have a lot to say. Typically, they just send a few bits and bytes of data every now and then that require long range that operate on small power budgets. So meaning most of those assets are typically battery powered. And uh, obviously that needs to be very inexpensive because we're really talking about connecting assets in a massive way, uh, let's say down to the level of, con uh, for instance, in the, in the supply chain and logistics to con uh, connecting uh, uh, containers as an example. So these technologies are, are excellent and we see, uh, let's say, the market dominated by four of them that I'm showing here. Uh, this is a picture from a, an analyst report from VDC Research that shows that indeed LoRa, NBIoT, LTEM and even Sigfox are dominating the market and are planned to dominate the, the market for the years to come. With LoRa actually having a quite a lion's share of the of the market outside China, where, where in China there, there is some mandate from the government to deploy uh, other technologies. Uh, but indeed, LoRa is dominating the, the, uh, the market here. So that is why we have selected uh, LoRa, LoRa, LoRa One as a technology uh, to actually uh, address the market and, and address actually one of the big limitations of all those LPWA technology, which is uh, network coverage. So here I'm showing some example of, uh, let's say, the coverage of the Helium LoRa One network. Here, focusing on the US, it's a global LoRa One network that is, that has the most, the highest number of gateways deployed. However, the coverage remains highly limited and centered around city. 
I'm actually showing also here the coverage of a very, very wide scale network also in Brazil with American Tower. Uh, also, we can see that as, a, as of today, the coverage out, when you go outside of Sao Paulo, you end up, uh, let's say, uh, leaving the areas of coverage and, uh, and uh, which is indeed problematic and actually a showstopper for many IoT applications. So another way to demonstrate this is, is uh, on this slide to explain a bit how typically lower one networks operate. Uh, so in urban areas, you see on the right side of the slide, you have those LoRa devices that can connect to a LoRa one gateways whose range is typically three to 10 miles, uh, probably less actually in urban areas, but still those devices are able to connect to these terrestrial networks, which is then backhauled uh, to the LoRa one network server via this link here we see in gray, via cellular, via fiber, and even sometimes via other satellite technology. But in other settings, suburban areas, rural areas, uh, let's say desertic areas, even at seas, where you have assets to connect uh, that, 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 that you would want to monitor and track, there is no coverage and there will never be coverage. That's what Alastair was mentioning as 85% of the earth uh, that, 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 that doesn't have and that will not have any, uh, any network coverage or whatsoever. So we set ourselves on addressing this challenge by deploying uh, and by creating ELO. So ELO is the name of this constellation you see here uh, in a low earth orbit that is uh, composed of uh, uh, let's say the plan right now is to have up to 25 satellites that will indeed enable those LoRa devices in those settings where they didn't have any access to, to a LoRa one network to connect and send directly their data to the satellites. The satellites will pick up those messages, bring them back to Earth during the, the, their journey because those satellites are indeed orbiting around the planet and moving in the sky. So they pass over our earth stations that we have deployed as well. And when the traffic is back on the ground, we route that data to the LoRa one network servers of our partners. So as an example, WILE or Senate. Uh, so we act as a complement of existing uh, terrestrial LoRa one network to really enable them to create offerings that uh, delivers, uh, let's say, a truly ubiquitous coverage that is composed of their own uh, terrestrial network plus uh, UTELSAT's uh, global uh, uh, satellite LoRa one network. So, in a nutshell, uh, let's say what this service is all about. Well, first, it's about delivering 100% Earth LoRa one coverage. So, I, I put that in the footnote that it is it, it is indeed outdoor. You need to have some, uh, let's say, some visibility of the of the sky for this to work. But this will work in, uh, let's say, in most places of the of the of the planet uh, where where you can indeed deploy lower one uh, lower lower one devices. Second and uh, quite important, it works in the same sub gigahertz frequency band where lower one networks are operating globally. So eight. 868 megahertz in Europe, typically, uh, 915 megahertz in, uh, in the US and in uh, other countries. So uh, that's, that's, that's basically a, really an extension of those terrestrial network in, the, in those areas. The, what you have seen also in the previous slide is the seamless integration with existing LoRa one networks. The data that we collect from devices uh, emitting their messages to our satellite constellation, uh, we route it directly to the lower one network servers of our partners. So it is transparent for them. It's uh, let's say in a format, in a method that is already that they already know and that they already operate. And for their own customers, it's completely seamless and invisible even because they get the same. Uh, le, let's say they, they get a single uh, a, a, a single um, a partner to get their hybrid uh, connectivity service from their terrestrial network partner that is now extended via our uh, satellite lower one network. Uh, the additional point at the bottom here is the negligible impact on the device bomb costs. I mean, why could elaborate on this? But indeed. Uh, our, our ELO uh, service 
doesn't uh, let's say uh, doesn't necessitate uh, let's say a big adaptation of those existing lower one devices so it's only about uh, a little change of antenna and, uh, and 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 an update of the firmware of those devices as as you have seen wide has already made available in the market a module a lower a lower module that is compatible with uh, elo so just add an antenna to this and that that works no need to redesign your device your lora device your lora object just add the antenna and update the, the, that that firmware and last but not least because lora it's about long range it's about uh, long battery life but it's also about low price and let's say uh, what we are delivering here is uh, let's say lower one connectivity global lower one connectivity at a price point that is uh, really in the range of uh, terrestrial lower one networks yes they, it, it it will be uh, probably a bit more expensive than this because uh, because the price of terrestrial lower one uh, uh, um, networks is uh, is extremely inexpensive and that's also what attracts uh, all the developers and solution builders but well, let's say our goal with us is really to be in the same ballpark in order to uh, to really uh, address the massive IoT use cases. So I will not spend too much time on that slide where I elaborate on the various verticals and use cases. Uh, Alastair mentioned that already. We see the biggest one being in the field of uh, transportation and logistics, of course, utilities, agriculture, oil and gas, uh, and, uh, and, and a few others. So here I would say that it's not only about moving assets. I mean, for transport and logistics, it is, and it is really, uh, let's say, a, a big opportunity to have this uh, global lower one satellite uh, connectivity for moving assets, uh, connecting uh, from pallets to containers to wagons, etc. But also to connect fixed assets that are well not moving, but spread across very wide areas of territories. That is, that is impossible to connect via terrestrial uh, networks. So in terms of timeline, where we are in this, yes, we are in the trial phase with select partners right now. Uh, we do already have global coverage with the uh, existing satellites we have uh, in space right now, global 100% coverage, because actually even with a limited number of satellites, they pass above every single point of the planet at least once per day. So that's what you see here. Uh, right now, you have, um, in average, two opportunities per day to send a message. That's not a lot, but that's already very good well, for testing, for sure, but also for, for a lot of use cases that we, that we see in those industries. Uh, but let's say from when we go live in the second half of uh, 2022, when we go commercial, well, the coverage will remain the same. We will just have more satellites that will deliver many, many more opportunities per day to uh, to send a message for a device. So we, this will ramp up over time uh, when we add more satellites to go into um, into a number of opportunities per day that is close to 50. Let's say in average, uh, every 30 minutes, uh, a device is able to send uh, a message. And yes, and actually that, that's it for now for the for a kind of a short introduction on uh, on on the, the Elo service. Uh, I will be happy to take the questions of the participant and uh, continue the discussion on this one. But right now, I will uh, let's say leave the floor to my uh, esteemed partner Bruce at Senate to uh, to explain what they are doing actually uh, with uh, with Elo as part of their uh, offerings. Good. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Bruce Chatterley. I'm CEO of Senate and. Uh, you know, we're excited about this, this consortium for a lot of reasons, but I think the, um, the four participants in the consortium have really sunk their teeth into a use case that has a dramatic uh, opportunity to not only leverage the technology, which is exciting, that both, uh, both uh, that, that the various partners are offering, but also to tackle a massive global problem and deliver real value in this case to track assures customers, uh, which then become our collective customers. So to put that in perspective, um, in the US, for example, there are uh, over 45 million containers, shipping containers coming into the top 10 ports uh, per year. So 45 million per year in just the top 10 ports of the United States. Um, 
To give you an example, uh, Senate right now has terrestrial coverage that covers about uh, anywhere from 70 to 75 percent of those, and we will we will have uh, uh, coverage to cover uh, almost all of those by the end of the year. What happens though when a container gets put on a truck and goes inland into this massive country? Um, and this can you can pick any country in the world, and the same problem happens. Um, you're going to pass through uh, terrestrial coverage in various forms, but you're going to pass through many, many areas, just like cellular, where you're not going to have any coverage at all. And that's the exciting part of this. And when Luke talked about pricing, uh, he talked about, you know, the potential for, for example, $4 per year uh, for, for an exclusive satellite. That's about, that's more than double um, what an average price for a terrestrial device communicating in uh, you know at, at, at you know reasonable volumes uh, would would cost per year and so what we're doing today is we're talking about a technology that allows you to solve the connectivity problem while optimizing the overall cost of that device on an annual basis meaning that when you can prefer a terrestrial device you can also optimize your cost um, and then you can limit uh, the the satellite connectivity to when you really need it. And that's what, what's exciting about what we're doing today. In terms of Senate, we, uh, we have a philosophy uh, that we've had for about five years now where we believe very strongly that the IoT connectivity business is not a build it and they will come networking opportunity. It's really uh, every opportunity that we've ever worked on requires very unique uh, geographic coverage and unique propagation, meaning strength of signal. And so what we set about doing is building a suite of cloud-based software and services to allow for the targeted deployment of IoT connectivity based on the lower WAN protocol, um, where it's needed, when it's needed, with the quality that it's needed and at the right price. And so that's what we're all about. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a couple of slides to set the context so that as we talk about the connectivity strategy for logistics, um, we can put it in the proper place in the industry. So the way we think about uh, IoT is that, um, you know, there's three kind of category, general categories. The first is things that are powered or uh, connected or close to the, uh, the delivery vehicle of the connectivity. So that's what you see in local area networks with things like, you know, uh, uh, Ethernet or Bluetooth, or Zigbee or Wi-Fi. The second is, um, you know, applications and devices that require high bandwidth two-way communication. So this would be primarily cellular, where you're looking at applications like uh, driverless cars, telematics, uh, video, and that kind of stuff. The third is where over 55% of the total IoT devices reside. And that is in uh, what's called low power wide area networks or LP WAN. And one of the core technologies in, in this category is LoRaWAN. Um, and let's talk about that a little bit. So LoRaWAN is a unique protocol in that it's optimized for battery powered devices. It's a protocol that's managed by, uh, it's managed as an open standard, an open published standard on a global basis. Uh, that standard is managed by the LoRa Alliance. Uh, of which Senate is a founding member and a member of the board of directors. And so we've had a significant influence and in, uh, in participation in the evolution of the standard. The standard has a variety of benefits, um, including things like long battery life. Um, you know, for example, we have many customers in the utility space that are guaranteeing 20 year battery life as part of their implementations of AMI. Um, significantly long range, we have uh, sensors uh, all over the world, in particular in the Central Valley of California, that are communicating with a gateway over 85 miles away in a production environment. Um, very low cost, as Luke said, and a variety of other operational capabilities that make it unique, including things like uh, a very, very optimized firmware update over the air capability, which allows you to uh, minimize data costs, but more importantly, minimize the impact of firmware updates over the air on the battery life of the device, unlike competing technologies like, for example, MBIoT, which a firmware update will take a significant amount of the battery life of the, uh, of the device over time. 
So uh, lots of different uh, capabilities that are unique to lower WAM, but I think the message here is the technology end-to-end -end is optimized for battery-powered devices. So as I said earlier, you know, what our customers are telling us is they need unique uh, geographic coverage and they need unique uh, quality of coverage in terms of, uh, of the, you know, the, the quality of the connection, the propagation. And so what we set about doing is building a suite of cloud-based software and services to solve the problem of not only how do you get the connectivity to the right place at the right, at the right uh, cost, but also how do you manage that at scale on a far-flung global geographic environment? And so what we've done is we've created the capability to uh, in a single platform. And, and by the way, some people um, in, in this industry talk about network servers. And yes, we have a network, network server for Lower WAN embedded in our technology, but what we've built here is an OSS, an operational support system, and a BSS, a business support system, which has a suite of design tools to allow you to figure out where the network's going and how to connect it, um, and uh, deployment tools to allow you to figure out and confirm the quality of the connection and the availability of the connection and, and to manage the deployment of that connection should you require that. And then lastly, and most importantly, I think, is the how do you manage all that stuff, all the, all the network access, as well as all of the massive number of devices in the field? How do you, how do you manage the, um, the device uh, uh, quality of communication, the battery life, firmware updates over the air, configurations, and all those things? And, um, and that's what we built into the platform. So just a quick uh, uh, summary, uh, I won't go into detail because the other presenters have already done this, but this is more of a Laura Wan specific view of if you start at the right, how, how, this will, how this is architected in the field. So on the right, you have sensors that connect to gateways. And in the case of satellite, these gateways would be in space. In the case of terrestrial, these gateways could either be the Senate carrier grade public network, which is an all 64 channel uh, macro cell, uh, massive uh, capacity network, or it could be in uh, a customer owned gateways uh, inside buildings and those kinds of things. The gateways then convert that traffic uh, in, in, into uh, IP, communicated in an encrypted form across the Senate platform to the application, which has the keys to both unencrypt and decode the data and deliver it to end users as uh, knowledge. So Senate takes all that and delivers it in two main products. Uh, the first I'll talk about is platform as a service. So platform as a service is where customers can bring their own gateways and they can connect them using the Senate platform and, uh, and manage them over time. Those, uh, those gateways can be either managed as a completely private network or hybrid network. And I'll talk about the value of doing that in a second. The second product is uh, network as a service, which is kind of just as it sounds. It's, uh, you, you could think of in this, in this product, you could think of Senate as the cellular carrier for LP WAN, LoRa WAN devices. So if, you're, if you can see a Senate network uh, coverage, you can connect for a monthly rate and you're off and running. Now, in addition to the Senate network, um, we, uh, we have also launched a series of services that we call Senate Lower WAN Extended Network Services. And uh, a great example of that is what we're talking about today, the UTELSAT uh, ELO service. But we've also, um, we've also offered uh, uh, extended network coverage through Helium and through our own invention, which is called the LP WAN Virtual Network. So Senate has, uh, has designed and, and uh, has patented uh, a philosophy and a, and, a, and a technical approach that we call the uh, LP WAN virtual network or the LVN. And essentially in a, in, in a nutshell, what this allows our customers to do is uh, anyone in the globe can connect a gateway using the Senate cloud-based uh, platform. And if you allow other Senate customers to connect to that platform, we will share up to half of our revenue from those customers with you as a participant in the LVN. And so in the end, what this boils down to is a unique way to essentially crowdsource a carrier grade platform or carrier, a global carrier grade network um, using the LVN. So this has been exciting and the growth in the LVN has been dramatic. The next capability that, that, that we've offered under extended network services 
is uh, access to the helium network. And if you're not familiar with helium, uh, helium is a uh, gives gives uh, consumers the ability to buy a helium gateway, which essentially uh, has the capability of mining uh, cryptocurrency called HNT. And the way those the way you mine HNT is through either proving that you've covered a geographic area through their algorithms or through passing traffic through your gateway. And so uh, helium, I don't know the latest numbers, but I think it's over 600,000 gateways have been deployed globally. And we've partnered with Helium to interconnect our networks and offer Senate customers uh, access to uh, the Helium network in addition to the Senate carrier grade network at no additional charge. And so what this allows you to do as a customer is you can densify. Um, so in a market where Senate has dense coverage, uh, this provides extra coverage to make sure your messages get through. And in markets where we don't have coverage, this gives you the ability to get a connection. Um, and what it allows Senate to do is watch where we have uh, high traffic areas and then go into those areas and deploy a carrier grade platform in addition to Helium. Um, we will be announcing in a couple weeks here uh, that in addition to North America, we're now opening up uh, to our customers the uh, Helium network in addition to Senate's network on a global basis. So this is exciting. So um, what we're here to talk about today is the, uh, the inter interaction with the ELO extended coverage. And, and we've partnered with uh, the, 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 uh, the four or the three other partners on this uh, call to create an end-to-end -end service for, that's targeted to supply chain and logistics. And as I said earlier, you know, $4 a, um, a year for an ELO specific uh, one message a day service sounds okay. But when you compare that to Laura Wan, it's, it's, it's quite a bit more expensive. And so the way this service will operate is you will have a device, which TrackAssure will talk about, that integrates the wild uh, module and uh, also integrates unique firmware that allows you to um, preference the terrestrial network. So as you're transiting through an, a geography, if you can see the terrestrial network, then uh, the device will connect. If it can't see the, the, um, the terrestrial network and needs a connection, um, it, will, it will uplink using the satellite. This allows you to really create the optimal mix of maximizing coverage while minimizing cost. And it's pretty exciting. So, um, Hopefully you've seen that um, what Senate is trying to do as part of this consortium is, is build a menu of connectivity options, flexible connectivity options that allows applications like logistics and transportation to satisfy their connectivity needs at the most cost effective rate. In addition to that, what we're doing is we're combining that with uh, you know, Senate's knowledge and experience uh, in being one of the leaders in the lower WAN industry and then wrapping that in what we consider to be the best support uh, in, in the industry. And that's evidenced by the raving fans that, that we leave behind in terms, of, uh, in terms of our customers. So with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Richard. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bruce and Alistair and uh, Luke. So I'll be here talking tonight about Track Ashore and you might have been expecting to see Don Miller. So I'm not Don Miller. And if you join this webinar because you've heard Don Miller speak before, uh, well, sorry about that. You have me tonight. Um, but uh, I am one of Don's partners and a board member of Track Ashore, and we're the logistics uh, partner and expert in the consortium. I'm also the CEO of a company called Globe Tracker, which is a market leader in providing um, tracking solutions for refrigerated containers and reefers. So I've been in logistics uh, tracking for a very long time. Um, but perhaps ironically, I started my career as a satellite communications engineer. So I know, I really know how hard some of this stuff is. And at that time, uh, the smallest dish you could get was about the size of your coffee table. But now we can talk about some, some other things. And I'm, I'm not going to go through uh, the, the background on Laura One. I think that the previous presenters have done a really fantastic job at that. But um, but what is going to be very disruptive here is the ability to leverage a combination of extremely cost-effective terrestrial LoRaWAN 
with the surety of the satellite connection any spot on the earth. And that will that will create a disruption market that will push down many applications that we have not seen possible as of today. My last company, I started tracking containers back in 2006, and we used satellite. And the only people that we could find that would pay for it was, was the U.S. military. So we ended up tracking uh, quite, a, quite a number of the, most of the containers actually going into Afghanistan. But at this level that we're discussing now, it's commercially feasible. And the ability to not require a customized uh, separate modem like some of the other uh, Leo, big Leos, if you want to use Orbcom, you have to buy an Orbcom module. You have to have to, and it works with Orbcom. So what Wild has done together was make a module that that is actually seamlessly communicating through the effectively same protocol terrestrially and celestially with, without having to duplicate that. So you have a, a kind of a, a, a bunch of different driving forces here where especially because of the pandemic, the urgency and the need for precise cargo visibility is really peaking. At the same time, most of the logistics industry is going through what they call the digital transformation. It's actually probably one of the last frontiers to, to digitalize, uh, considering, but it does involve the physical movement of cargo, like banking and, and publishing and music distribution. So, but most of the operations of the supply chain are actually done via Excel emails and, and I hate to say it, but phone calls sometimes. So the idea that you can put IoT devices on not only transportation assets, but also cargo itself and make that uh, intelligent and take it back into a business analytics network and take it through artificial intelligence and provide users alerts and be able to monitor and control and predict problems before they even happen. And if you do have issues, in particular, in cold chain is, is a very big area. Um, perishables will spoil or pharma vaccines may, may become damaged. Then you can know about it and prevent it before that actually happens. And so the big question is, you know, there is people use cellular. Uh, cellular has been uh, a technology that's that's been used quite effectively for tracking. That's most of the most of the UPS trucks, most of the the fleet management systems around the world are using cellular to track. So what so what makes this special and different? It's a few things. Warobon was didn't we don't need to transmit gigabits. We don't need to be 5G. <laughs> so if you want, if you really want to uh, to to send uh, small bits of data, locations, temperature readings, controls, maybe a shock value, things like that, then LoRaWAN is your man, and you will be able to have much lower cost devices which will push down the application use cases into things that were impossible before, like pallets, like packages even, into, into dollars and not tens of dollars for tracking devices that can last a long time. The second very interesting thing about Orlan is it's a very, I'm gonna get a little technical here, but it's a very, it's a very robust link budget to restaurant. So that's why when, when Luke was saying earlier, you can have a single gateway that transmits to three to 10 miles. It's not a, this is not a cell tower. This is more like a Wi-Fi router sort of gateway. So it's very cost effective to put up an infrastructure. And, uh, and it's, it, and, it, and you can also transmit over long distances, but we can also use that same radio strength capability to get out of a container, which is all metal. It's like being in an elevator. They call it a Faraday cage in some cases. And through dense cargo, like far, like you know, uh, pharmaceutical biopharmaceuticals, most of the most of the biologics these days, the high liquid content, which absorb the, the those signals, or lettuce or or fresh produce. So it has some very unique applications that create the ability for the first time to actually monitor cargo inside of a container wirelessly and be able to get get the the signals out. 
So we're very excited about this. Um, I've been in 15 years of, of logistics and, uh, and tracking, the tracking business, starting with containers and, and reefers. And I've never met anyone who doesn't want to know where their stuff is and how it, and what condition it's in. But the next question is usually the stumper, which is how much is it going to cost me? And this consortium with this technology and the use cases that we're looking at for packages, parcels, containers, and, and moving up the chain into port assets, into warehouse distribution, and other things like that will create those price points that make this feasible in the market. Thank you very much. And, uh, I guess we'll be taking questions now. So, yes, I, I've got a list of questions here. I, I've tried to select a few of them for, for, for you all. So, Bruce, what other application providers are you seeing as interested in this new technology? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, the the uh, applications are uh, limitless. Uh, there are some constraints around it, obviously, but uh, one of the areas that we think is really interesting that we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in is in uh, a category that we call tank monitoring in, uh, for example, oil and gas fields. So if you think about, for example, uh, remote Alaska wildlands or uh, northern Alberta in Canada, where there are significant uh, oil wells, and, and uh, looking at the, the requirement to monitor a wide variety of, of uh, tanks in, in that environment uh, with no other alternatives for connectivity. Uh, it's a great application, and we're working on opportunities in that area. Um, in the utility space, uh, I think Luke can talk to this one too, but uh, there's a great example of a perfect fit application for this, which is in uh, electric utility pole monitoring. So electric utilities want to know when there's a power outage, where did the, is there a pole uh, knocked over? Or just was there an accident and a pole got knocked over? Um, you know, ultimately, I think in addition to just the pole tilt, um, the opportunity will also be uh, in the third category, which is uh, fire monitoring. So in particular, in places like California and the mountains and, you know, Washington, Oregon, uh, elsewhere in the world, um, you know, there are a lot of fires started by electric poles tilting over or overheating. And there's not a lot of connectivity options in these remote, remote areas. So the ability to have a pole monitor uh, that's also monitoring the electric field of the power, that's also monitoring heat, humidity, and air quality, you have the ability and the ingredients to create an early warning system for wildfires and nip them in the bud before they get going. So that's an example of just a couple of the things that we've been working on. That's fantastic, Bruce. Thank you for that. Um, I've got one here for, for Rich from Track Ashore. Um, if a temperature sensor is inside a container, how does the signal get out? Well, that's a that's a great question, um, and a lot of people ask that question. It's the same question that you get when you lose your cell phone in an elevator, or a container and elevator both made out of metal. So a container is, uh, you could consider it what the uh, RF engineers call a Faraday cage. So it's all metal, so it would, in principle, absorb all the signals. But it's an imperfect one because it has gaskets, it has other uh, imperfections that will allow signals to get out. And because of the what's called the coding uh, game, the link budget of the LoRaWAN network, um, you'll be able to get those signals to uh, sources outside the container through the walls. You don't always lose your signal in the elevator, uh, and LoRaWAN will give you probably about uh, 30, maybe 30 dB better than you might have with technologies such as Bluetooth. It's also a lower frequency, which helps a lot too. The lower the frequencies, the better their penetration through container walls. And being sub gigahertz is a big plus for us. But compared to Bluetooth, which as everybody knows, or Wi Fi is 2.4 gigahertz, it'll absorb a lot more of the energy. So the combination of the, the, the modem technology, the communications technology, and coding gain, and the low power, the, I'm sorry, the low frequency will allow you to, to be able to get the walls out. Hey, Bruce, that was an excellent answer. Thanks very much. Um, I've got one here for you, Telsat, Luke. Um, do you expect to support other LP1 technologies in addition to LoRaWAN? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Indeed, LoRaWAN is let's say one of the largest technologies. We I, I showed that in one of my earlier slides. 
uh, in the LP1 world. There are others, including in uh, from the, the cellular, the traditional cellular operators. We as a satellite operator, we want to extend them all. And we want, because the, they, they, face, they all face the same challenge of coverage. We are starting with Laura One uh, because we can do it today because there is uh, the right ecosystem in place to do that because there is the right standards in place also to do this. Uh, we'd love to do it for other technologies, but it's just not ready uh, because of uh, several uh, challenges in terms of uh, standardization and change of, uh, of, uh, of standards. If you think about NDIoT, et cetera, yes, it could work over satellite, but you need to upgrade that and it requires some long processes of uh, standardization. Also, there is also the challenge of uh, how to access the specific spectrum that NBIoT operates on. It's now owned by all the telcos of the world, et cetera, that have paid billions for these airwaves. So how do you actually get access to that? So we, we, we'll, we are monitoring these other technologies and uh, we will get there when the time is right. But uh, at the moment, the time is perfectly right for LoRaWAN, and uh, and that's why we are actually uh, accelerating and partnering with you guys to uh, to really change the game for connectivity globally. Hey, thanks, Luke. That's, that's an excellent answer. Um, I've got a, a few more. I'll try and get them through quickly. So there's another one here for you, Bruce. Um, I think you've got a customer would like to get started. So the question to you is, uh, if you have an application for the satellite IoT, uh, including Senate's terrestrial coverage, how do I get started, Bruce? Well, I would say uh, the easy way. So first of all, we would like to work on those through the consortium because uh, Alistair and I have kind of figured out that the best way to uh, to rapidly solve the problems uh, with customers is for uh, the three or four of us to kind of work on them together. So, so um, what you can do is you can contact any of us in terms of Senate. Um, our website is www.senetco.com. -E Click the contact us and, uh, and uh, send us a note and we'll get right back to you and we'll have a discussion. And I'm sure the other guys uh, on the call will have the same capability. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Uh, that's correct. Um, so there's a couple more questions uh, come through. So another one for TrackerShore. How do you see the market grow, Rich, from cargo monitoring to other transportation assets? Well, that, that's a, that's another fantastic question. And I think it's, it's actually the other way around. I think that the asset monitoring of the uh, conveyance and the equipment that operates the supply chain will probably be the first thing to be monitored. We're seeing it today with refrigerated containers. There, there are a number of major shipping lines that are implementing uh, tracking and monitoring two-way, in this case, monitoring technology on refrigerated containers. Why? Because there are expensive refrigerators that move around and get dropped in ports that carry expensive and, and delicate things like, like pharma vaccines and, and perishables, uh, fresh produce. So I think that you'll start seeing the ability to uh, to monitor a lot of the uh, the assets that are used to transport chassis, by containers, port equipment, all things like that. And that will move down into pallets. Now, there are only, only say, 25 million containers in the world, but there are 9.9 uh, .9 billion pallets. So now you're talking about market sizes that are that are much larger than the actual supply chain uh, equipment itself. And then when you move into packages, uh, and and it could start with niche pack niche uh, packages, high value or or critical delivery packages, and then it will move right down as the cost uh, moves down into the um, into the supply chain to lower cost packages where pretty much everyone will want to know the real time. And this is the important part about it, because you can look at a FedEx delivery right now. You can look at look at where your container is and see where, you, where, where your ship may be, but you really don't know exactly where it is. You just know the last point that was scanned somewhere in the network. And the technology and the capability that we're talking about now is going to allow you to do real time, have real time data, which creates a whole new world of actionable intelligence and business analytics 
to eventually we'll, we'll have something that might be considered like a self-driving supply chain, just like a, a Tesla. You might have only human intervention required when there's an exception as opposed to the normal movement of goods. So we think that's the future and it will move from the transportation assets into the cargo. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for that, Richard. Um, that's great. So there's uh, quite a lot of questions here. There's there's one for for me, Alistair. Uh, you said you've launched uh, Wild Connect modules, terminals, and evaluation kits. So where, um, who, and how can I buy these? Um, so the the answer is pretty simple. Um, we, we've the the kits are available. The evaluation kits are available. The modules and the terminals. Um, you can actually go onto our website and fill in a pre-order form. Um, if there's, you're interested in contacting me directly, you can contact me through my email address, um, which you, you saw at the beginning of the presentation, but it's alistair.williamson at wildnetworks.com. Um, so yes, please, I encourage you to, to contact us uh, either through the website um, or directly with me and um, we, we can start to, to look at shipping your kit. I have one last question and uh, it's actually, I think it's sort of been answered before, but I think it would be interesting. It's for Luke. Besides transportation and logistics, what other industry verticals which UTELSAT see the most impacted positively by its satellite LoRaWAN service? Yes, that's a, that's a that's a good one. I mean, we we cover that. I think you cover that, Alistair. Uh, even uh, even Bruce on uh, on that one. I would mention uh, a single one. I would mention agriculture. I mean, it's all been great and uh, and and nice to talk about smart agriculture, but up to now, there was no connectivity in the fields, uh, uh, in rural areas. No matter what you would say, there was nothing, just satellite, but satellite has been extremely expensive and extremely also not, uh, not uh, power friendly. Uh, so it was not deployed typically for agriculture whatsoever. So now when you can connect very low cost sensor devices, uh, based on LoRaWAN te LoRa, LoRa technology, and that those sensors can connect no matter where they are, outdoor, uh, but yeah, in agriculture, in the field, in trees, etc., that's where you are. When you can connect them directly to satellite at an inexpensive price point, suddenly you really open up this, re this smart agriculture market. And that's what we see as attraction. I think, Alastair, you can confirm that that uh, it's going to be huge as, as, a, as a next vertical in addition to, to transportation and logistics to really make that real uh, connected smart agriculture uh, throughout the world. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, uh, Luke. Uh, we, we're seeing significant um, incoming inquiries in agriculture with agricultural companies looking for technology to to support their industry so i i wholeheartedly agree with you um i think we've really sort of come to the end uh, of the webinar but what i what i would like to do before we end is is firstly to let everyone know that uh, the presentation will be emailed to all the attendees tomorrow so you, you can have a look at the slides um but i, I would like to 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 thank Luke, Bruce, and Rich, you know, thank you very much for for, for your really interesting and informative presentations. Um, I think it's been a great session, and I, I hope as an audience, um, you've you've taken away some um, knowledge um, that you may found helpful for you. So, in closing the webinar, thank you very much to everyone that attended, and thank you very much indeed to all of the presenters. Um, been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.